Don't That Beat All by Elise Smith Cooper. Characters, Gina's Thompson, DJ Thompson. Setting, Gina's comfortable, well-appointed kitchen. Gina is between the sink and refrigerator and table prepping lemonade and bowls of stew, setting the table for two. The time is late afternoon. Gina is busy preparing the food for the table. She doesn't look up as DJ enters, holding her device, reading intently. Hi, sweet pea. I haven't seen you since la late last night. I love that since COVID hit, you don't have to rush out early in the cold mornings to the office. Just wash your face, comb your hair, and turn on your computer. What a world we live in. Uh, Mom? Excuse me, Mom? Could I please have a cup of coffee? Lemonade is better this time of day. Reaching out to pour a glass of lemonade. Won't keep you awake all night. I've been waiting on this day since before you were born. When I saw that sonogram and knew you were my baby girl, I started seeing you grown up and a beautiful bride. Today we get to plan your wedding extravaganza. <laughs> you and Prince Devon. Gina continues stirring the stew and talking without looking up or responding to DJ. I was just talking to Mother Mays yesterday about how you two grew up at Mount Moriah singing in every choir the church had and acting in every play. I need to call her later to see how the lunch went with the pastor and the mother, mother's board. Gina looks up at DJ. Girl, what's wrong with you? Mom, please sit down. You haven't had anything hot to eat all day. That's why you look so pitiful. At least get a little bit hot stew in your belly. Then you can sip on my special lemonade. Thanks, Mom. My appetite is gone. I need a cup of coffee. Never mind. Please sit. Girl, we are getting ready to plan the most fabulous day of your life. You and Devon are getting married. <laughs> we could be more exciting. What could be more exciting or important than that? You're so dramatic. Mother, sit down, please. I have something important to tell you. Well, for you to use that tone of voice, it must really be something. Gina turns, looking at DJ, but doesn't move. You never listen to me. I'm trying to tell you something. Why won't you listen for a change? Gina crosses the table and plops down defiantly. Well, what? I don't know how to say this. I'm heartbroken. You knew Pastor Mooring took the mother's board to lunch in the church van today. On the way home, there was a terrible accident. An 18-wheeler jackknifed on the freeway and hit them head on. The pastor is in ICU on life support. All four of the old dear mothers were immediately scooped up into the arms of Jesus. None of them survived. I wanted them all in my wedding. No such thing. You must have it all wrong. Well, who told you that lie? I just got off the phone with the church secretary. It is all over Facebook. All the old dears are gone? Uh, how could that be? I talked with Mother Mays yesterday. You're always getting news backwards. This can't be the truth. Is it? Tell me it isn't true. I have checked it out thoroughly. My heart is broken too. I do not always get things backwards. You have a habit of not listening when I tell you important things. Those old mothers mean the world to me, too. They showed everyone so much love and compassion. Those old dears were my backup, backbone. <laughs> they prayed me through my entire young life, and even till now. That this, this is just wrong. Why are, why are they taken away now when we need their, their wisdom more than ever? They're supposed to be at you and Devon's wedding to speak blessings over another generation. <laughs> I should go to the hospital to pray, to pray for Pastor. She tries getting up, but her legs don't hold her. She falls back into her chair. DJ, checking her own tears, inching slowly towards her mother, scoops her into her arms, holding her tightly, stroking her hair. There, there, Mama Sweepy. The old dears poured their lives and prayers into us and our community for as long as they could. It is selfish of me, I know, but it is unfair for them to go home before they could bless me in Devon's marriage. Come on now, Big Mama. Look at me. Take some deep breaths. We're gonna get through this, and I think you, me, and Devon should help with planning their homegoing celebrations. You have been planning events at church and in our community for as long as I can remember. 
that might ease the pain a little bit. Right now, I'm gonna make a strong pot of coffee, call Devon to give him the news and ask him what he thinks about my idea for us to offer to plan the church ceremonies. Then we can all pray. Pastor and the church family still need our healing prayers. The old dears used to say to us kids, if you have tools and don't use them when you're facing challenges, who is the fool? Hmm. <laughs> Sounds like you done got some mother wit <laughs> and some grit to go with it. <laughs> well, don't that beat all. I'll take a cup of, co of that coffee you talking about. <laughs> don't that beat all. End of scene. Actor one, gaze in a cage. What are you doing? What am I doing? I'm in the park breathing, sitting at a stump, taking physical exercise, trying to mitigate the disastrous effects of drug abuse. It's because I say I believe in magic. Where's the magic? Jerry invited me to Nightmare on Normal. I didn't know I needed a ticket. Gaze in a cage. A $15 ticket, a QRC code that I don't know. In five minutes, I create a costume and a character. Gay man, sexual shaman, and puppeteer. Because I need to hit all the buttons at once. Because I love fur. And I have still in the bag a marionette dog, and silver skull ring, and braided necklace of garlic. Halloween. What was I supposed to go as, a traffic cone? <clears throat> That's not my style. I take off my shirt and put on the fur hat, a costume complete. I ride to the party and I find I cannot get in. Gaze in cage and I cannot get in. <laughs> Actor two, the red patch or Goya's photographic memory. I dutifully filled the contract for beef, crab legs, and pudding. I airlifted air conditioners and trailers. Is that what I did? I forget. No more food. I see trailers eaten. I see air conditioners cannibalized. I see a trail of trash argued over. War replaced by war until nothing. Memories, too, with a half-life of 20 years gone, then sensible to start over again and again. Bang! Like the universe at the end of its expansion, I recall and start over again. I remember all the worlds, lapis lazuli. I remember again, I want to see the mines, quarries, the purple rivers flowing, and so I go and go because my ideas have been folded into sense. Sense, and I step. Bang! The disasters of war are so pretty. His charcoal scalpel sharp. He draws the lines, the borders defined. He knows his shadow. He smiles, proud of work well done. Radioactive crab legs cultivated for king. Shoe leather beef for a man that eats a warrior's feast I fed. I see air conditioners cannibalized and killed. After the tragedy, I starve, forget, and then start over again. Actor three, Candlesticks I. The first thing that comes to mind is a casserole, a mid-century casserole dish at Lid that belonged to my mother's farm. She kept it in the barn along with a dusty old sunfish that needed to be repaired and bags of dirt, fiberglass and epoxy. Even before I was born, I always admired its size, shape, and glaze, like the gayness in my genes. I know mid-century aesthetic, a little post-mid-century, 1961, still atomic before my time, when everything was possible. 
I don't think anyone knew it was there, so I claimed it without contest. Glaze, fire, proportion for a side dish of beets or something you don't eat very much. Of because, but nice to have on the table because it's pretty. Even as a little boy, I dreamed of pretty, fabulously attended dinner parties, starting with cocktails and ending with port in Shropshire blue with vagrancy and a touch of pretension, corned off carefully to limit the danger. The vagrants could have the bedroom. They could do whatever they wanted. I wanted the damn casserole. I also wanted the candlesticks. Eight and a half pair of them, worthless dinged up pewter and gypsy brass, but I wanted them for the same imaginary dinner party that I would someday have. Mama died when I was 13. 13, 13, 13! Patty from Portsmouth, our in-law, wanted a pair. I stood up for myself. No, they must remain a set for the integrity of the dinner party and for the table. Sisters stood up for me. They raised themselves from their chairs. Patty, you have the pearls. They were twins, so they said it twice. Patty, you have the pearls. Eight pairs, for God's sake. What does he want with eight pairs? The brother Michael piped in. What the hell does he need with eight pairs of candlesticks? The jewelry is yours, Patty. Let him keep the sticks. Let him light his imaginary table with them. Let him break them, melt them, give them away, lose them, trade them. Let him do whatever the hell he wants with them. The casserole came without contest. Thirty years later, when I got it home, the first thing I did was drop the lid. <laughs> shattering it into a million little useless pieces, and I cried. Have y'all been to a dinner party when someone breaks a wine glass and then 13 people decide simultaneously to go gorilla and clean up? The dog, get the dog out of here, leave it, leave it, leave the glass, leave the shattered little pieces, leave them scattered, get another glass and go on. They're cheap. It is all cheap. Starting off with characters. Characters Dalian, Dahl. Aileen's husband is usually referred as Dahl and is 35 years old. He lived with his parents most of his life and has not worked since the onset of his drug addiction. Aileen, Dahl's wife, who is 31 years old, who just started her new career in the Navy. Waitress, a 40 year old female who works in Dahl and Aileen's favorite Thai food restaurant. Scene one. Dahl and Aline are newlyweds sitting together inside a Thai food restaurant bar called the dot 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 that they discovered near their new apartment in San Diego. They scan the menu before they order their first meal. Ooh, what do you think about ordering a few of these egg rolls and sharing a pad thai? Sounds good. Can we order some beers too? Uh, how about we split one? Trying to cut down on the alcohol, hon. Aline raises her hand to grab the attention of the nearby waitress to start the order. Hey, guys. How are you doing this evening? Great, actually. We just got married. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm so happy for you two. Can I get you some champagne for the occasion? Actually, it sounds like a good idea. Get, get us a bottle of champagne, two dragon's milk beers, and an order of egg rolls and a pad thai. Aline glares at Dahl as the waitress writes down the order on her pad. I'll get those right away. The waitress walks away from the table. I thought I mentioned we were cutting down. Yeah, well, how about we live a little and celebrate our marriage? <sighs> Come on, just this once. Promise. Fine. Aline picks up her cell phone and veers her attention away from her husband. Babe, look at me. What's wrong? Absolutely nothing, hon. You're quiet. Can you tell me what you're thinking? OK, if you really like to know. You do this constantly. Do what? You're constantly going against what I think is best. What, not celebrating? Cut it with the snarky remarks. You know what I'm getting at. I'm trying to help you and me. 
us from not going down the drug and alcohol rabbit hole again. We've been doing well, and now you want to relapse? That's not gonna happen, I promise. Please, just stop making promises you know you won't keep. We've been at this for six years, and I've been by your side constantly making sure you're not shooting it up. Shh, can, can we stop talking about this here? What's wrong with you? Aline jerks back and is distraught by the statement, what's wrong with you? Tucks her head in her hands to calm down. What's wrong with me is I'm trying to help you with self-control. All right, thank you. <laughs> the Dispensary by Daryl A. Davis Sr. Tucker sits on his bed with his back against the headboard, attempting and failing to roll a blunt. His fiance is blasting Mbop by Hanson. He shakes his head, wondering why his fiance likes this song so much. Contemplating a financial issue that could become problem problematic, Tucker composes himself, then attempts to get his fiance's attention. Babe! 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 Alexa, pause the music. What in the hell do you want? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing? I know you did not just kill my vibe and then tell me nothing. Jackass. Seriously, though, what do you need? Tucker makes his way to sit at the front of his bed. They have tons of theories about this coronavirus thing. 45 said it's a hoax. What do you think? I think you need to find something better to do with your time. Gesturing towards his poorly rolled blunt. Because this ain't it. It still trips me out that you won't get a pipe or a bong. For as long as I have known you, you have never been able to roll a blunt. How do you smoke and can't roll? Carefully. And sparingly. Anyways, don't you think this shit is crazy? What's crazy is that the people who are supposed to prevent this sort of thing getting fired, and they got a thing got fired. And they got fired by the guy who got famous for firing motherfuckers. <laughs> He's going to fuck around and get reelected. <laughs> Ready to finish his drying her toes. He better not. America can't fall for the same shit twice. Bush? Shut up. Then Bush two more times. Uh, if you don't quit, look. We survived Republicans before, and we will survive this one. Hell, why are you bullshitting? We had to survive a few Democrats as well. That's the problem right there, having to survive. We can't advance as a people because all we were taught is how to survive. Survival. Black folks have to be surviving for so long. Some of us, most of us, have confused survival with living. Lenita reaches out to rest her hand on Tucker's leg. Look, babe, whatever happens, we will get through it. My daddy always said, fix what you can, the rest will work itself out. Wait, it's not like you to be all political and whatnot. You are not slick, what do you want? Me, what, me? Oh, boy, no. please, you better quit playing with me. I know you, you only talk politics when you're trying to get, in a, get me in a good mood, get in a good with me. Okay, all right, uh, okay. Let's say hypothetically that I'm no longer eligible for my scholarship this year. And bartending and Uber driving may not pan out if they declare a pandemic. The owner of the dot said he may have to choose, close down if this gets too bad. It's frustrating as hell to be this close to getting my degree, only to be fucked over in the 11th hour. Lenita stands and gestures for Tucker to join her, and they embrace and then face each other holding hands. Look, everyone at some point has to make a way out of no way. The hurdles are relative. Your, your hurdle is financial, and because you don't have the means to fix it, you have to figure it out. I know, but not having the money sucks. Tucker and Lenita release hands. You have been without money most of your life, so I get that this is triggering. Look at it this way. You've been in a financial pickle before. You have the experience to handle it. Imagine a person who has always had money. What are the odds that they would be able to survive without money? I would say this is a bit more than a, a pickle. Who says pickle? Who says pickle in real life? <laughs> Lenita goes to grab her suitcase. I said what I said. So, I was thinking, hypothetically, of course, maybe we dip into the savings and. Uh, uh, hypo pacing the room. Hypothetically, huh? Yeah, hypothetically. Mm, well, unless you are dipping into a hypothetical savings account, no. Why not? It's not like we don't have look, it. Look, look, I love you. I do. Having it is, is, not a pro is not the problem. We agreed that we could not afford 
your grad school right now. You decided to get your master's instead of taking that job making 80K a year. So dipping into our savings to pay tuition that we agreed we could not afford deviates from our financial plan in which I have set aside contingencies and our uh, um, your tuition is not one of those contingencies. I'm trying to be the first in my family to have a master's. And I, I understand that. How about we be the first in both our families not to live check to check? I know this is important to you, and because of that, it is important to me. But we have to be smarter than that. Sometimes life isn't fair. You'll figure it out. Hell, you find money for we without dipping into our savings. We back on that now. I mean. If you can find money for we, you can find money for school. This, that is a few hundred, not thousand. That is also your problem stemming from your choice. Come on, Anita, all I need. Uh, 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 who are you talking to like that? You better take some of that bass out of your voice talking to me. You tripping. Maybe you need to order some more weed to calm your nerves. Whoa, whoa, what was that? Nothing. Uh-huh. That's what I thought. Now, come help me pack. I refuse to rush in the morning. Yes, my love. <laughs> By the way, do you think it's a good idea to get out of town during all this? I planned this trip last year, and I'm going to see my mama come hell or high water. Besides, I will only be gone for a week. You're taking all of this for seven days? Six days. I'll be back Tuesday. Speaking of which, when am I going to meet your parents? We're engaged, and I haven't even asked your father's permission to marry you yet. Boy, please. The last time I needed that man's permission for something, he taught me how to forge his signature. Damn. I was eight. Eight? Damn. I, I am sure you will meet him one day. You two have a few things in common. Like what? One, you both love me. And? And you both smoke weed. Well, he smokes. I have no idea that uh, what you call yourself doing. Oh. <laughs> You got jokes. <laughs> you said he never really took to fathering because of his Navy career. But I mean, we have been together for almost four years, and I've never met him. Y'all beefing? We talk in text as much as we can, but it is what it is. No beef, just distance. Anyways, go put these bags by the door. I don't want my Uber driver to have to carry the bags too far in the morning. Alexa, play. Lenita and Tucker look at each other and laugh as they both begin singing and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who says it's standing between us? Get out of the way. <laughs> okay. Cast of characters. Manuel Cillian, a young, dark, Dominican male with a strong accent, born in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, teenage years spent in Washington Heights, New York, naturalized citizen, early 20s, current active duty U.S. Marine Corps enlisted, rank sergeant E-5, MOS, infantry, 0311. He is married and has a son. Chino C. Dupley, a young, dark Haitian female, slight Creole accent. She worked on masking her accent due to racism, bullying, assimilation. Born in Port-au-Prince, Port Haiti. Raised in Little Haiti, Miami, Miami, Florida. Early 20s, current active duty U.S. Marine Corps enlisted, rank sergeant, E-5, MOS, personal retrieval and processing technician, 0472. Mortuary affairs. She is married and has a daughter. Location, Forward Operating Base Al-Assad in Al-Anbar Province, Iraq, November 2004. Scene three, Chow Hall. The scene starts with Sar Sergeant Chino C, dutifully on platform three. She has a Chow Hall tray full of food, she looks around the stage as if she is in high school cafeteria looking for a cool people to sit with. She is disappointed when she can't find her click. She drags her boots from platform three to platform one where there is a cafeteria style table at its center. She sits down and starts to eat. Sergeant Manuel Cillian walks into platform two with a chow hall tray full of food. He looks around the stage as if he was in a high school cafeteria looking for the cool people to sit with. 
He's disappointed when he can't find his click. Char Sergeant Chinnelsey dutifully looks up to see Sergeant Manuel Cillian, and she mutters something under her breath. Sergeant Manuel Cillian hears her and grins. There are no other seats in the child hall. He has to approach her. Sergeant Man Manuel Cillian is enjoying this too much. He's playful. Hey, Sarge, mind if I sit? Actually? Manuel plops right next to her. General Say dutifully is annoyed, but continues to eat. Her mouth is full of chow as she talks. Go the fuck on, then. Yes, Sergeant. Are you the first one in your family to walk on two feet? <clears throat> At this point, there's a banter <clears throat> exchange where Manuel Cillian slurps his soup like a pig in a trough, <clears throat> all while maintaining eye contact with Tennessee, dutifully. She is visibly grossed out by seeing the soup run down the corners of his mouth and down his chin. Manuel uses his shirt to wipe his face. He burps and blows it on her. Genose is dry heaving at this point. God damn, is Chow here always this good? Not anymore. So, what is there to do around here? I don't know, bathe. Manuel sniffs <clears throat> his armpits. He is impressed with the quality of his musk. He search, scratches at the underarm stains of his skivvy shirt and offers Chenose to smell his finger. Laundry. Manuel then smiles his, smells his shirt. It smells like a fart. He tries to fan the stench away. Also, why are you here? Three hots and a cot. What the? Yeah, the Marine Corps promised me three hot meals and a cot to sleep in. Every day, I signed a contract, I looked at the fine print, so three hots and a cot. I am hungry, there is food, so I am here. You really are an empty jarhead. <laughs> Why are you here? As in, why are you on this base? Who are you with? Where is your battle buddy? Who is your supervisor? You're a grunt. You can't walk three feet without telling subordinates or superiors, especially in a combat zone. There's a beat before Manuel answers. Manuel is conflicted. He doesn't want to seem vulnerable, especially around Dufali. At least not yet. He's distant. They each look at their respective platforms, two and three. There's a spotlight on them. On Manuel's platform two, there's a ba battlefield crucifix. On Dufali's platform three, there's a lifeless dummy on the table. The spotlight then turns off before Manuel continues. OFP, I guess. Huh? Own fucking program? Look, we were authorized a 72 hour pass before we go back to Fallujah. I actually don't know where my Marines are or where my leadership is. Uh, is that weird? Yeah, but you're weird, so. <laughs> Funny, but, but they won't miss the flight on Sunday. Anyway, I answered your question, so answer mine. Huh? What's there to do around here? Oh, right. Snaps her fingers. These next few exchanges are snappy as they interrupt each other, borderline stepping on each other's lines. There's a big PX, the size of a Walmart. They've got a fine-ass collection of deodorant, like Cobra, Axe, or whatever eau de toilette. <laughs> Some what the que? Damn, Sargento, de, de donde eres? That means... I know what that means. I'm from Miami. Uh, okay. Not the way you were speaking on the phone, nena. I mean, where are you really from? You see, back in Los Estados Unidos, I live in Washington Heights, pero I was born in República. I know exactly where you're from, Sarge. We island neighbors. She finishes her food and gets up to walk away. Quick history lesson. Dominican Republic-Haiti relations have long been complex due to the substantial ethnic and cultural differences between the two nations and their sharing the island of Hispaniola. The living standards in the Dominican Republic are considerably higher than those in Haiti. The economy of the Dominican Republic is 10 times larger than that of Haiti. The migration of impoverished Haitians and deep-set cultural differences have contributed to a long-standing conflict. Immigration from Haiti resonates in high dissonance with the Dominican Republic, Dominican people. It has led to anti-Haitian feelings and mistrust of the Haitian people. Another problem with Haitian migration into Dominican Republic is that it blurs the line of citizenship. This factor of migration affects not only Dominican economy, but its cultural culture as well. History lesson complete for now. Back to the play. 
Manuel stands tall. He's more formal now as he extends his hand to shake hers. Sergeant, I I'm sorry. I didn't catch your name. Dear Philly, it's Creole. For what? C uh, Creole for what? God made her. Genose walks to the platform three. There's a soft lighting in platform three, enough for the audience to see her beautiful black features, the cheekbones, the hair, the difference in pigments between her palms and hands. Maybe she dances, maybe she doesn't. Maybe she's at a parade rest. Maybe she goes back to work and inventory is another dummy. Maybe she does all of the above. But it is important that her movements are like poetry. Manuel smirks, grabs the tray, sets it back down, walks away from it. It's time to educate the audience on borders and the effects of them. Manuel, in his best English colonized voice, spits history. There's an artificial line that splits the island of Hispaniola in two. On one side is Haiti, and on the other side is the Dominican Republic. There was a time when that split between the two countries was drawn with blood. The 1937 Parsley Massacre is widely regarded as a turning point in Haitian-Dominican relationships. Relations. The slaughter carried out by Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo targeted Haitians along with Dominicans who looked dark enough to be Haitian or whose inability to roll the R in perejil, the Spanish word for parsley, gave them away. The Dajabon River, which serves as the northernmost part of the international border between the two countries, had risen to new heights on blood alone, wrote Haitian-American author Edwige Dantica. The massacre cemented Haitians into a long-term subversive outsider incompatible with what it means to be Dominicans. Genose dupely walks off platform one and onto platform three. Manuel Cillian walks off platform one and onto platform two. He looks at Dufali, and she looks back at him for a beat. We've, We've got, got history. history. They turn to the audience. We've, We've all, all got, got history. history. End of scene three. Thank you, thank you. The eulogy. Characters, son, 50s to 60s, dad, 70s to 80s, dead. Lights come up on son sitting in a plane chair and a coffin on a stand. Coffin is open enough to show that there is a body in it. That's the dad. Dad must be able to sit up to talk to son. Son stares at the coffin for several beats with a blank expression on his face. It's only when he breathes a deep and troubled sigh that you understand the emotion he's feeling. So it's over. You finally gave up and let go of life. Well, it's not like it was unexpected. You were sick for a long time. Actually, I wonder how you managed to hang on for so long. Uh, so, now I'm supposed to eulogize you. What, what am I supposed to say? We didn't have the best relationship, did we? You know, when I was a kid, I thought you were the coolest dad in the world. You did things that other kids' dads didn't do. They were all so ordinary. Then there were times I thought you were the sorriest excuse for a dad ever. I thought your advice was so poor that if I did the opposite, I would come out better. Back and forth, back and forth. It seems I could never make up my mind. Sometimes you were so angry and other times you were a gentle man. How do I tell people what you were? Everyone will be looking. Everyone will know. Dad sits up and looks at son. Ah, wasn't so bad, was it? <laughs> son rolls his eyes and face palms. Figures you wouldn't go quietly. How was I supposed to go? With some sense of dignity, maybe? You're supposed to be dead, remember? Well, I am. Then why are you sitting up and talking to me? Dad looks around. Damned if I know. You know, it's true you weren't the worst dad. You were better than some of the neighborhood fools, better than a lot of the clowns some of the kids I went through school with had to put up with. You just made me feel like excess baggage sometimes. I didn't. I took you places. Yeah, then made me sit on the sidelines while you goofed around with your friends. And you didn't seem to have any trouble spending time with my brother either. 
But you had a lot of fun, didn't you? Sometimes, yeah, but I wanted my dad to teach me things, to involve me in his life. I taught you things. Sometimes. Most of the time it was, figure it out for yourself, boy. And you did, didn't you? What about how much further ahead of myself I'd be if I didn't have to figure everything out for myself? Yeah, but you learned how to figure things out, didn't you? Besides, I didn't have the time to show you everything. We're getting off the point here. What I wanted was for my dad to pay me some attention. I did. Nowhere near as much as you did yourself. You got more attention from me than I got from my dad. <laughs> from what I've heard, that's not saying much. I don't suppose you remember the time you laughed at me. What are you talking about? Did you say something funny? I was in fourth grade and I was in my usual place on Saturday morning watching the cartoons. The cat walked in and you said to the cat, Hello, stupid! Since I was watching the TV and not you, I thought you were talking to me, so I answered. And you laughed. Why the hell would you answer to that? Because that's the way I was treated at school and on the playground. It was the cruelest thing you ever said to me. What the hell was I supposed to do? I don't know. Maybe be concerned that I would answer to that and, and find out why and maybe, like, comfort me and tell me I wasn't stupid. But you weren't stupid. Remember that reading test you took in the fifth grade? The one where you scored at college level reading? Yeah, I remember it. Hell, you wouldn't let me forget it. It's like it was the only thing I did right if anyone listened to you. See, there you go. I was ten and it was one time. Still. You're ignoring the trouble I had with math and science. So it wasn't your best skill. You had other talents. But I struggled so hard with math, and when I couldn't get it, you sometimes treated me like there was something wrong with me. I never did that. <laughs> of course you didn't. Uh, come on, I, I've had, I had to have done something right. Yeah, you did do some things right. You made that paper calculator for me in third grade while I was struggling with my times tables. See? And that break you made for my soapbox derby car was brilliant. So it wasn't all bad, I was it? I never said it was, but it was more bad than not. For crying out loud, I, I was lonely and sad. That's what hurt me the most. I learned early that I had to hide it around you. I, I had to pretend to be a good kid, and I wasn't very good at it. I did my best. I did more for you than my dad did for me. You don't know what he was like. My life was best when he was away. I don't know everything, but I heard some. Sometimes I think we moved to California so you could get away from him. That's not true. I always wanted to come to California. Sure you did. I did. If you say so. Well, for crying out loud, we had similar interests, didn't we? Airplanes and boats and cameras and stuff. Also true, but it wasn't enough. A boy has a reasonable expectations of things from his dad. Okay, all right, so I wasn't perfect. Can you blame me? My dad was a bastard. I didn't want to be like him. And you weren't. So? This isn't about blame, Dad. It's too far gone to talk about blame. If this isn't about blame, why are you even bringing it up? Because I'm supposed to talk about you and I'm having trouble sorting out what to say and what to keep to myself. I can't forget these things, you know. Why don't you just get over it? You're a grown man and this stuff was a long time ago. Hell, I got over my dad. Really? You think so? Have you forgotten about the time I told you mom was afraid of granddad and you got so angry talking about him that eventually you couldn't speak? If you'd listened to mom and talked to that counselor when I was in first grade, you might have been able to shed the crap that your father dumped on you. What are you talking about? I never went to a counselor. Yes, you did. The school couldn't, fig the school couldn't figure me out, so they sent me to a counselor. Mom went and she told me you went too. But you came home really upset and refused to go back. I don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. That's <laughs> so you, Dad. Denying anything that's uncomfortable. It isn't uncomfortable. It just didn't happen. It did. I think you would have had a better life if you had dealt with it instead of ignoring it. That stuff's all mumbo-jumbo anyway. You just need a positive attitude, that's all. Jeez, oh, listen to you. A positive attitude? What did you... What, what did that get you? A failed marriage, estranged kids, a spotty career? Estranged? What are you talking about? I saw you guys regularly. Do you see anyone but me here? No, but they'll come. You'll see.
Besides, if you're all so estranged, why are you here? Because you're my dad, for better or for worse. Mom taught me to take care about family. And I didn't. No, you didn't teach me anything like that. <sighs> so what do you think you'll say about me finally? I'm still not sure. It keeps coming back to this. How can I talk about you and say the good things without mentioning the bad? Can't you talk about the things I made? That telescope with the filters, the underwater lenses and strobe and stuff? What about those? And your soap, your soapbox third be car. You mentioned that. Everybody knows about those. You want me to laud you? Never mention that, you, that you're a flawed being? Why do you have to mention flaws at all? Because they affected me is why. If I stood in front of a crowd, they'd see that I was lying if I only talked about your accomplishments. I've never been good at hiding my emotions. Maybe you shouldn't say anything at all. And no worries, Dad. I have time to sort it out. I'm not worried. You were always good with words. Thanks. I think I'll go now. All right. See ya. Dad lays back down. Stands up, walks over to Coffin, and after regarding Dad for a moment, reaches in and smooths his hair. Then turns to audience. So there it is. The end. He was an imperfect man, deeply wounded, but unwilling to face it. He was a clever man at times, and for that I should salute him. But he could also be distant. When it comes time to stand up and talk about him, I think I'll just say, I think I'll just say, he was my dad. Coffee, Tea, and COVID by Stephanie Burnham. Carla, a 40-something woman. Michael, a 40-something man. Sam, busybody, waiter. Setting, a seafood restaurant located in California. Time, evening, present day. Act one, scene one. Carla sits at a square table across from Michael. Sam rolls a bucket of ice with a bottle of champagne next to the table and exits the stage. I've always wanted to eat here, but I've, I'm never in the area long enough to stop anywhere. I'm always trying to get out before I get stuck in traffic. The traffic around here is exhausting. That's why I figured it would be best to meet after rush hour. He deftly uncorks the bottle and pours champagne into their flutes. Mm, look at you with the uncorking skills. <laughs> to crazy uncorking skills. To crazy uncorking skills. Carla and Michael drink champagne until their flutes are empty, then set them on the table. I hope you don't mind me speaking freely, but I can't remember when I've met a woman as beautiful as you. If speaking freely means giving compliments, have at it. <laughs> Usually beautiful women have no trouble in getting men. Why would you need a dating app? It helps when you want to be selective. You look so good in all your pictures. I thought I was going to be catfished at first. <laughs> Where are you going with this? <laughs> I'm just going to say I'm a bit suspicious. Women like you don't date guys like me. I may have watched too many scary movies, but I hope you're not thinking of slipping me something and taking out my kidney. If you are, then give me something to smile about after all is said and done. <laughs> you figured me out. Curses foiled again. <laughs> I'm glad you could take a joke. <laughs> Way to go, Mike, but you had me for a minute there. I like a guy with a sense of humor. Ah, my sense of humor is quirky. <laughs> I guess that's why I didn't make it in the stand-up world. Mm. I was on the same stages with Kevin Hart and Mike Epps. Hey, well, at least you can say you tried it. Ah, now I DJ at celebrity parties. Oh, Friday then. At least you're still in entertainment. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be DJing at Kevin Hart's party this weekend. Would you like to hang out with me? <laughs> of course, I would like to hang. Where do I sign up? I've always wanted to go to a celebrity party. With your long lashes and perfect <laughs> skin, I'm surprised you aren't in showbiz yourself. I'm in the money biz. Then it's a second date. You're, you're going to have a good time. 
<laughs> Sam re-enters the stage. Would you like to see a dessert menu? I'll pass. Yeah, same for me. I'm stuffed. <laughs> You're going to miss a great tiramisu. <laughs> Hard pass. <laughs> Sam exits the stage. Such a nice dinner. I don't want to spoil it by stuffing myself. You certainly look like you take care of yourself. Well-toned. Do you work out? Every now and then. The last few dates I had, the women could have been... <laughs> they could have benefited from the gym. Oh, whoa. To each their own. How many women have you dated so far? I opened that can of worms. <laughs> okay, so far it's been six. How about you? So far, you're the first one I found. For real? What can I say? I'm new at this. But with COVID-19 going around, I heard people are using one plus one to connect. You've got to be careful, right? What do you mean, careful? Oh, I'm not vaccinated, by the way. Are you serious? My ad said that you must be vaccinated. I told you I wasn't vaccinated at the start. She pulls a mask out of her handbag and dons it. Well, I don't remember anything like that. I told you I'm for medical freedom, by the way, and you said okay. So being for medical freedom means you're against vaccines? You were doing so well. Why'd you have to ruin it? Because I follow what science says, if that's ruining it. There's a host of scientists that disagree with guys like Fauci and the CDC. There's uh, No sense in arguing. Let's get the checks and call it a night. Just because we hit a snag? Or what would you call this? A deal breaker. Sam re-enters the stage, but lingers close instead of approaching the table. Aren't you going to ask me why I'm not vaxxed? Okay. Why are you not vaxxed, Michael? My doctor advised me not to get vaccinated. Are you immune or compromised? Nope. He just told me the risks outweigh the benefits. Sam approaches table and places card on table. Can I get you anything else? Coffee? Tea? What's this card? It's my vaccine card. <laughs> I'm vaxxed. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're listening in on our conversation. Hey, 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 man. <laughs> hey, what do you think you're doing? Get out of my... Beautiful lady. I couldn't help overhearing, and you shouldn't have to put up with this with us. <laughs> if she goes out with you, you will be putting. She will be putting up with less. This man is my roommate. Sam exits the stage. <clears throat> you are date number seven for him. If you don't make it, he'll just go to number eight. Well, I'll be. Hey, Ooh. don't we still have a second date? No, we do not. <laughs> if you want a nice vaccinated guy who's not going to throw a lot of politics your way. Then I'm your man. Oh, you're so gangster, but I love it. <laughs> Take my number. I get off at 11 o'clock. Oh. I thought you wanted to meet some of my friends. Moot point. Well, pay for your own meal if you want to act like a bitch. Don't worry. Oh, oh, oh. Don't worry about your meal, Carla. I got you. <laughs> Michael stands up so hard, he knocks things over. I'm about to jump in your shit, asswipe. You and who else? You've got it coming. Oh, okay, okay. You guys settle this without me being around. Sam, I'll call you later. Carla exits the stage. Michael grabs Sam by his collar and they scuffle. Thank you all so much. Really quick before we go, could you all just on the mic really quickly introduce yourselves to actors starting from my right towards the door? Yep. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, Ruben Rubio. Hi, Eddie Yarrow. Hi, Yolanda Franklin. Reese Green. Benjamin Cole. Leovina Charles. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. We appreciate you so much. Yeah.